into the world to be our Savior. And uh, it was a center of intellectual performance, not just uh, activity, but men would go there and argue a great deal about religion, about philosophy, uh, their own theories of life, and they would uh, actually debate. It was a place that then also became a center of legal activity because it became a kind of what we would say today the courthouse or maybe the supreme court of Greece and uh, lots of people were tried there many were condemned to death even and uh, so you you know this site is very important you look at the majestic, the majestic structure and realize this was not just some little back room of a courthouse where they tried people this was a major center in the world then and even today. If you go and uh, make a tour of the Holy Land, you're inevitably going to end up in Athens. And uh, I've had people give me the opportunity to go to the Holy Lands and see a lot of different places. And I think one of the ones that would have most interested me would have been the city of Athens. And uh, history is filled with information about activities and battles and struggles that took place in it this particular city, Athens. And, uh, you know, one of the things that was amazing is as I was going through the study of the Book of Acts in my first courses at Free Harmon University, uh, as I came down to Acts 17, and I was a recent convert, I hadn't been a Christian for too many years, and all of a sudden, I got to Acts 17, and I began to realize this is amazing it's marvelous and one of the things that was most interesting about it was that this young jewish boy who had become a man of notoriety among the jewish people well known in jerusalem and so forth was able to walk into this city where the thoughts and the teachings of the great men that had been there, Epicureans, Stoics, and others, uh, were just really overwhelming. It was it was something that grabs you instantly. And you realize that as Paul walked into the city of Athens, he began to see things that he had not seen before, as we're going to read, read again here, uh, that uh, really got his attention. One of those things was that these people worshipped them all kinds of different gods that had different uh, religious theories but uh, that they were very mistaken about who God was and that's what we talked about today and as we were singing we shared with each other the idea our God 10,000 reasons and things of that nature that we just finished singing uh, let us know that there was a lot to be said about our creator that the people who were in the city of Athens and thought they knew everything did not know. They were very ignorant in many ways, even though they professed to be the smartest people that had ever lived, perhaps, on the face of the earth. And so as you look at this structure and you think about their history and you think about their glory, you understand why Paul had been nervous when he was called into question about what he was preaching. See, he came preaching about Jesus Christ, a Jew, not a Gentile, who had come to the world and who had died for our sins and who was buried and resurrected. That was the point that really got their attention. He lived again, he died, but now he's alive. And uh, they questioned that a lot. They had doubts about the possibilities of that. But uh, the Apostle Paul did an incredible job. You've got to go back and read it over and over again this week after we get out of this assembly and realize just what an unbelievably good logical presentation the Apostle Paul made as he stood before these geniuses as they so thought of themselves in the city of Athens and explained to them how they were really very ignorant how that they were not as smart as they thought they were and how mistaken they were about 
eternity about God, the creator of the universe, etc. So the Areopagus is still to this day a very significant structure. And as we go back down and look at Paul's message, just a couple of the verses that uh, Paul read for us. In Acts 17, 22 and 23, we read about this particular event. Uh, I think I left my glasses there, Dan, if you want to bring it. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus, and uh, that had to be interesting when he just stood up and began. I mean, it, it's one thing to see it. It's one thing to be near it. It's another thing to stand up and address the people that are there. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. Well, that probably went over quite well. They probably were happy with the fact that he had noticed that, that there are uh, people who are interested in religions, interested in gods. They had lots of them that they respected. And he says, I see that in every way you are very religious. You worship a lot. You believe in something spiritual and you share that amongst yourselves and you debate the issue. Whereas I looked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, that's what he did. He had gone through the city of Athens, that's a smart move on his part to see what was going on there before he addressed the Areopagus and all of these intellectuals, the elites, and uh, tried to get a handle on what they were doing, what they were thinking, and how they were living. And I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship. I, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. He says, uh, I'm not accusing you. I'm recognizing that you have stated already that you're worshiping a God that you don't even know who he is. So what are you doing? Okay. Uh, you're worshiping an unknown deity. And yet you worship him. Why? They had so many gods that they worshiped that they were afraid that if they didn't mention all of them, that one of them would show up one day and destroy Athens. And so, uh, consequently, they, they put an altar to an unknown God. So if any God ever walked in and said, uh, hey, guys, I noticed that you're worshiping all these other gods, Zeus and everybody else, but you're not worshiping me. They say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we have been worshiping you. Look, look, see, to the unknown God, that's you. And they'd be saved. But he says, you're worshiping something that you yourselves admit you don't know who he is, how he is, what he wants, that's ignorance. And he says, but I'm going to tell you who the unknown God is. I'm going to tell you about the one that you've overlooked. I'm going to tell you about the one that you need to know that you need to worship. I, I mean, I don't know how that impacts you, but all of that, well, what should I say, reasoning, the validity of what Paul was saying, the convincing spirit in which he delivered it, the fact that he was standing there in the Areopagus and speaking to the elite of the world at that time and had the guts to just break open the whole theme and say, you're worshiping ignorantly. And I know that because you yourselves have admitted it. You've admitted that you're worshiping a God you don't know. And he says, I'm going to tell you about it. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. They had temples everywhere in Athens, still do to this day. And he says, but the God who created all of the world, all of the universe, that is the only true God there is, that doesn't uh, live in temples. You build them, you can name them, and you can talk about the gods that this is in favor of, but uh, no, no, no. You're mistaken. God does not live in temples built by human beings, human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if, as if he needed 
What? You say anything. He doesn't need anything. So my topic today is what God needs. And now you have the answer, don't you? What is the answer? Can't hear you. Nothing. He doesn't need anything. What's he short of? Nothing. Where is he inadequate? And nothing. And what should we provide for him so that he can be complete? Nothing. God doesn't need anything. Does he need a temple? We can build him a temple. We can create some figures out of gold, if you wish, or out of silver, or bronze, or wood. We, we, we can carve something to, to represent him. What does he need? Uh, what, what should we take to his temple that we're going to build for him and his name? How should we describe who he is on the outside of the temple we're going to build for him? And Paul says, you don't need any of that. One factor is that God is unique. There's no other. There's only one. So you don't have to distinguish between the true God and all the other gods. They don't count. He does. And you've been providing for these other gods that you imagined exist. You've been providing a way to worship them, images that you could serve. And God doesn't need that. He doesn't need that. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath. And what else? I didn't hear you. Everything. Everything else. He provides it all. So, what other God is there? There is none. Who is this God you're proclaiming that his son came to this world and died and was put to death and, and then was resurrected? Who is this Jesus you're talking about? God is the only one who can give us life. He gives us life. And the breath we breathe. Have you ever thought about that? I, I'm really amazed at the, the universe as I see it being exposed to us in these days and realize how little we knew about the universe until that we began to search with our new telescopes and realize that, oh, we, we had no idea how many stars, how many galaxies there are out there in the universe. And, what we missed in the past, we thought 3,000 stars were kind of itch, you know, but that's all we can see with our eyes. But there's so much more. This universe is incredible that God has made for us and placed us in the middle of it. And uh, we haven't been getting any radio signals coming in, but there are a lot of telescopes and there are a lot of uh, big antennas out there trying to capture who's out there that we don't know about. And uh, the silence that comes back is deafening. We're in. And, and what about these other planets? Could we live on those? Let's, let's go to the moon and live. Uh, yeah, we've been there. It's kind of a dusty ball that doesn't have much to offer us. Uh, there's no water there. We've been to Mars, and we think we found a place where there's a little bit of ice, so there must have been some water. And, and we keep hoping that we'll find another planet so that when we mess this one up bad enough, we can go there. And it's just not there. And then we look at the planet on which we live, and uh, the, the life that God has given us, we have it. We've been born. That was the plan of God. And uh, we breathe. What do we breathe? Well, it's a mixture of nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide now, and, and other things. But I mean, all kinds of gases mixed together. And uh, when you mix them all together, what do you have? You have the perfect air to breathe. Oh, what a coincidence that the only planet where we know that there has been life has the perfect air to breathe but that's not all it has think about the number of things about our planet that make it possible to live here 
Think about water. Do we have water on earth? Oh, yeah, we have a lot of water on earth. We have sometimes too much. But uh, we've got air to breathe, fresh water to drink, salt water for our ocean so that we can have all of the forms of life that are submarine in nature. It's incredible, incredible how perfect this planet is for human beings. And, and the planet didn't become that way because of us. And we didn't make it what it is. We found it. We were placed here. We were put here by God, the only one and true and real God. And the Athenians didn't understand that. As a matter of fact, when Paul finished speaking to them, there were some believers that came out of that message. I, I've asked myself many times, how is it even possible to imagine Paul going before the Areopagus and making this wonderful explanation of who God is and what he does, and then for them not to believe, but some did believe and became Christians. Others thought he was being foolish and didn't believe it. But he talked about what's out there. And then the apostle Paul was just repeating what David, King David, Shepherd David, had seen as he took care of his flocks as a young man and looked into the sky. And he says, when I consider your heavens, talking to God, the work of your fingers, he understood what creation was and that it wasn't our task and it wasn't our performance, no. The moon, the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? And he didn't even know that the rest of the universe was not populated with other creatures and other human beings or something like that. But, but uh, he was just looking at the world he could see right around him and the skies above him. But he realized what an incredible job God had done. And what a wonderful, wonderful master we have. And so he was amazed and pleased. But he says, I can't really understand, though. As I look into the heavens and see all the stars, the moon is right here in front of us. I can't, I can't believe that you're treated as so wonderfully, God, that you've given us so many things to admire. Oh, it's the work of your fingers. A God who does all of that, makes all of that with his fingers. What a God. And when he walks into the Areopagus and realizes he's dealing with people who worship all kinds of gods and are all mistaken, he, he realizes they need to know about the real God, the true God, the one who made all of this. But then he asks himself the question as he looked at it. Who am I? Who are the rest of these people? What is mankind that you should care so much about us? You think about the foods we eat. Oh, you think about all of the treasures that we've found here on this earth. Man, I think about it. I, if you listen to the news, you know, do we have enough oil to last for another 300 years or more? Oh, I think you have a lot more than that. I'm one of those, and I'm not going to get into science right now, but I believe that the, the earth replenishes the amount of oil that's down there for us. The energy that we haven't even begun to use yet. And uh, as I went to Tar Lake in Trinidad, where every day so much tar was bubbling up from the down deep in the earth that they have no idea how deep it is and it bubbled up and bubbled up and bubbled up and cooled the surface during the night and go out and fill up trunks and trunks. They had to finally bring in tractors to be able to take the tar up. Men would go out with picks and axes and, uh, before and load up trunks but now huge, huge pieces of uh, machinery are brought in to harvest that tar. If they don't harvest it, guess what happens? 
it starts consuming millions of your land. So they have to get rid of it. And it just keeps coming back, coming back, and coming back. And the question is asked, where's it coming from? It's God providing for us what we need. But how many other planets have that much petroleum product underneath the surface? That much energy available to its people? What about our sun that doesn't just cook us, but it's, you know, sometimes a little warm? We've got guests from uh, Texas uh, today with us that, that know that it gets kind of hot down there. And uh, yet, you go to the North Pole, it gets kind of cold, but people live around the equator. They live at the North Pole, South Pole, people survive. And uh, why? Because this planet that has been created by God for us is perfect. It's unbelievable how God has provided for us. We didn't produce any of the gas, oils, the beautiful skies above. We didn't create the animals. We didn't create anything. And yet everything is perfect for us. It's like, would you come to dinner on Friday night? Sure, I'll be glad to. What do we have to eat? You name it, we can have it. And that's exactly what God has given us. He's given us a banquet. He's given us air to breathe and everything else. Amazing. Oh, obviously, God needs us, right? Does he need us? Tell me, does he need us? Yeah, so with man sinned enough, Genesis chapter 6, that's not very far over into the Bible. God decided to do what? He says, I'm going to destroy man that I made. Didn't say I'm going to get rid of all the air, all of the water, all of the animals, all of the vegetation. No, no he didn't say that. He says, I'm going to eliminate man from this planet. I made it for them. I put them here, and now look how they're living. They're just violent, constantly violent and horrible, immoral, and I'm going to destroy them. Did he really need us? No. If Noah had not found grace in the eyes of the Lord, was it? This beautiful, wonderful planet that made perfect for us would be uninhabited. God doesn't need us. What does he need? <coughs> Nothing. What does he have? Everything he ever needed. And more. <laughs> what does he create? Everything we need. Oh. So you mean when he told him to build that ark that it was necessary for that to be done for mankind to be rescued? Absolutely. Well, what about all of the people, the millions of people that died in the flood? God didn't need them. They weren't meeting any of God's needs. God had no need that they could meet. And so he destroyed them because they were wicked, evil, corrupt, and started all over again. And he put a rainbow in the sky to indicate what? I'm not going to do this again. And everything is reserved now to the day of judgment when he will once again come and judge us on the basis of our behavior. But what can we say about our relationship to God? Then? This is important. I mean, I'm, this will be the most important part of what we're going to say, but at the same time, probably the most brief because I really wanted you to capture the essence of what the Apostle Paul was saying to these men in the Areopagus, the elite intellectuals of his time. But there's something more basic and simple. God loves us. First John 4, 19. He made man. He made everything. He made the universe. But he loves us in a very special way. And I go back to the same question we just asked earlier that David the shepherd, as he looked into the sky, asked, what is man that you're mindful of him? What is man that you care about? It's amazing. 
that God even cares about us at all. But the scripture tells us something even more marvelous in 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. It is amazing. I mean, a lot of the things about the creation are amazing, but one of the most amazing things of all is the fact that God loves us. When you look at our history, you look at our behavior, you look at what he had to deal with when he sent the blood on the earth, you look at those people and you look at all that's happened and you ask, why, God, would you bother? Why would you create the whole universe and put us here and give us all of these blessings? And then after we have been so disobedient, so corrupt, why would you be so good to us? And the answer is simple. He loves us. And I don't have the answer to that. I'm going to be honest with you. I really, I'm like David. Why would you bother God? And every one of you knows that you have sinned. And you know you've disobeyed God. You know that we don't deserve the universe we live in. We don't deserve the planet we're on. We don't deserve the continent we're on. But all of it's been given to us because God loves us. And I cannot explain that to you. I cannot explain it to you. But I can tell you one thing. I'm very grateful for Aren't you grateful for that? Oh, yeah. In spite of us, he loves us. And so that's not one of God's needs. If it had been one of his needs, he wouldn't have brought the flood on the earth ever. It's not a need. It's a want. It's not a need. It's a desire. It's not a need. It's something that pleases him. And so he does it. But if you think he needs us, and, oh, he couldn't exist without us. Oh, yeah, he did before. What about all the angels that were in heaven when uh, Adam was made? Adam came along a little bit late, you know. Uh, there were other beings that God had generated other than himself. Heavenly beings that we know a lot about, but there's a lot we don't know about them. But nevertheless, they existed. And, and God loved them. And uh he almost wiped out humanity. And he still would have had Gabriel as one of his angels. Michael is one of his angels. He would have had angels. And he wouldn't have been alone. But he wasn't lonely. God doesn't need angels or us. And there were angels that were cast out of heaven and are in prisons of darkness right now waiting for the judgment. Just like there are men who have died. And who are waiting for judgment and not going to be very pleased with what they find. But God wanted to do this. It's a desire that he had, not a need. And so the question is brought up by the Apostle Paul to the Athenians. What does he need? And what was the answer? We read it. We saw it. Nothing. He doesn't need anybody or anything. But he loves us, and so here we are, spared. In James 4.10, we're told to humble ourselves before the Lord, and he will lift us up. And that, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you today. Uh, you say, well, why did I get up and get dressed and come to worship with this crowd this morning? It's because we love God, and God loves us, and because we need to humble ourselves before God. We don't need to be arrogant and think, I don't think I'll go today. I'm not, I'm too busy for God. Don't get too busy for the God who destroyed almost all of humanity with a flood on one occasion is talking about a judgment day to come. We need to give him all of our attention and humble ourselves before him. We're not God. We're not even close to being God. We can't do what God did or Perform what he performed. We can't do that. The Apostle Paul knew that, and he, that's why he criticized all of those gods of the Athenians and said, There's only one true God, and it's the one you're worshiping as the unknown God. But he's known, and I want to proclaim him to you, but uh, we need to humble ourselves before God. Do not be anxious about anything, 
but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. We need to go down on our knees before God, humble ourselves, and tell him what we need. Ask him for what we must have. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You'll find, you'll find a great blessing in going before God humbly, recognizing your sinful nature, and just ask him, God, please, be merciful to me, a sinner. He will have great rewards. What else do we do? Well, we give thanks to the Lord. As just mentioned in that previous verse, it's mentioned in this one too, Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. Speaking to one another with hymns, songs, songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, for what? For everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul was trying to tell the Athenians. That's what you need to be doing. You need to recognize there's only one God. He made it all. And he is the one who can bless you. And has blessed you. And given you a wonderful life on this planet that he created for you. And has offered you an eternity of joy. But you've got to humble yourselves before him. Not try and compete with God. But to admit that he is God and you're not. And then James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. You know, God could have left us, left us in our ignorance. He could have left Paul the apostle in his ignorance if he had not given us his word. But we have the Bible. We have the scriptures. We know who God is and we know how he is and what he's about. And we know what we're to do and what we're not to do. And uh, he says, but you need to be careful to be faithful and do everything that the Bible says, everything that God tells you to do. And you say, well, I don't have time to read the Bible. Oh, my. Think about who he is. Think about what he's done. Think about how we compare to him, his holiness, our unholiness. And we think about what he has created and what he's done. And the but I need to get into the book. I need to really get into this in the scriptures. Find out what God wants me to do and become everything he would like for me to be. God wants me. Not giving up meeting together at some or in the habit of doing, which is the opposite of what you did this morning. But encouraging one another and all the more you see the day approaching as you realize that the judgment day is coming. You, we, need to, we need to be on top of what we're doing. We need to be reading the scriptures and knowing what God wants us to do. We need to put this as a priority. I know getting up and going to work on Monday morning is a priority for you, but uh, giving God the time that he wants is a greater priority. And then in 1 Peter 2, 9, we used this just last week. But you are a chosen people. And I go back to what Psalm 8 says, who in the world are we? Who in the universe are we that God should choose us to be his special people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Oh my, that seems so hard to believe. But it's true. Then you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And that's what God has given us. So what does God need? Nothing. What does he want? He wants us. He loves us. And don't you find it amazing that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life? Isn't that amazing? Would you call that amazing grace? Yeah. That's that's what we have. And so who are we? We're a bunch of Christian people who come together every Sunday and worship what we not ignorantly serve, but we come together to worship him who we do know because we've read about him in his word. He's, he's revealed himself to us and he's 
let his son die for us. And so, just like I don't understand what's behind the creation of the whole universe or why I'm here on this planet, but I, I do know it happened and I know it's true and I know it's because God loves me and he's included me in his plans and I'm grateful for that. And I look, I, I want to serve him every day. Every day I want to pray to him. I want to talk with him. I want to read his word. I want to get closer to him. And I want to know that that's the most important thing I can ever do while living on planet Earth. Amen? Let's do it. You agree? We're all on board? Okay. May God bless you.